Excellent, thank you. All right, and then from over here, what was your question that you discussed and uh, one of your answers? Um, I think we came up with more actual questions than answers. Um, questions are good. <laughs> <laughs> like, the um, question I came up with was, are the animal hosts susceptible to the diseases that they carry or only they, are they only carriers? And then uh, that dips into biochemistry is yeah. what is protecting them from getting the disease they carry. Yeah. That's a great question. So, and the, the best example of that is, is, is HIV, the AIDS virus, okay? So we know if you go to Africa and you, and you look in primates there, monkeys and apes, they, all of them carry viruses that are basically HIV, the AIDS virus. They, they have viruses that are very, very similar. Um, it's a very high prevalence in many African primates. It's an endemic. It's all of different species of monkeys all have it. But they don't get disease, okay? So something about them and how they interact with that virus that's not causing the disease. Now what that is, we really don't know. It's also, I mean, it's a huge thing. Do we know why the AIDS virus doesn't cause disease in these other animals? But there's no good answer. Now I say this with, I, with great certainty, but we now think, this, uh, this work was published just two or three months ago, that chimpanzees may actually get an AIDS-like illness, okay? So, H, uh, so HIV-1, the main strain of HIV that infects humans, that comes from chimpanzees, okay? We know that pretty well now. We used to think that chimps were completely, uh, had no disease at all, okay? they're completely benign. They've now done work going, looking in chimps in the wild, because it's very hard to work these things, these animals in the wild populations, looking in chimps in the wild, Jane Gombey's chimpanzees in Tanzania, Jane um, Goodall's chimpanzees in Tanzania, sorry. And they look like their life expectancy is shorter if they have the virus. And their, their T cells, their, their cell, cells in their bodies, are having kind of malignant um, effects on them, we think, due to the virus. So that idea that these animals are not suffering from AIDS-like illnesses may be false, and we're just not looking at them in wild populations. These monkeys, for example, live way up in the canopy. They're very hard to study in lot. We can't look at them like we do humans. So we may, and they, they die of other things before they die of AIDS. So maybe we're just missing this whole disease in, in animal populations because of our bias in how we sample them. So watch this space. It was a great question you asked, and we, we just don't know the answer. What was the question that you discussed, and uh, what was your decision or answer? Um, we discussed the third question, what will emerge next, and can we predict viral emergence? And we were thinking about some of the criteria that you discussed um, about how uh, these diseases tend to emerge when humans get a disease from an animal that they eat. So that's one criterion. And then um, these diseases are also emer emerging in certain areas where the ecology is changing. So um, we were actually wondering if it's possible to assemble like a database of past outbreaks and then learn the patterns and then use that yeah. to search. Yeah. yeah, and what you say is absolutely true. So what, one thing that people are doing now is making databases like this to try and predict emergence. But the problem is they're hugely biased because what they do is, for example, one, one thing they do is say, where do viruses emerge? What places in, in, on Earth are the most likely to have an emerging virus. They make a map of these hot spots of, of danger areas of emergence. But they are not the areas where the thing emerges, they're where people live who get infected, okay? So go back to HIV again. HIV was first described in the USA in the early 1980s. In Africa, the first big AIDS infected country was, was Uganda, was East Africa. Now, it's South, South Africa, it has a big AIDS burden. HIV comes from West Africa. Okay, completely the different area. So a hot spot where people are ill is not where the thing comes from. West Nile, for example, remember West Nile up in New York and around here 10 years ago? West Nile looks like it may have emerged in the US. It's not, it came from the Middle East, okay? So trying to, these maps are fraught with error because where you detect it is not where it came from, okay? My own, my own kind of $2 answer is I think this is very, very hard to predict. And I think we're in danger if we try and predict things of getting it badly wrong. And I would hate to kind of be the person that said it'll be this and it's something else. SARS, um, SARS came from nowhere. I don't, if you asked any virologist on the planet in, in 2002 what's going what's to emerge next, no one would have said a coronavirus. They, they were benign, cold-like viruses. It was, just came from nowhere. So... Um, to me, that's a, it's a great question. If we can do it, um, 
great. I, I spend my daily life trying to work out what the rules are, trying to understand them. I can tell you some very general things, but I, I prediction, I, you know, it's, hard, it's very hard. To me, it's better to have a better surveillance network so that we, we, we can watch very closely when something does emerge, we act very quickly and the world kind of shuts down and we identify it and we try and make a vaccine, etc. That to me is a better use of, of funds than trying to go and just predict what's going to happen because I think the error factor is just going to be enormous. Here's one more example. At last April, I was in Africa um, at a meeting of, of flu people in West Africa and kind of one, we were there to, to assess what's the likelihood of, of avian flu emerging in Africa? Because we know that Africa and Nigeria, is, for example, is getting lots of avian flu cases. So could avian flu, H5N1, the one we were worried about, could that strain emerge in West Africa? While we were there, flu emerged in pigs in Mexico. Okay, so we got it completely wrong. And all the people there had to go back to Mexico immediately, leave our meeting. And I got this photograph of me holding chickens in, in Dakar. You know, will it emerge here? And I'm completely wrong. So, um, you know, even saying it's a, a flu, we know, a virus we know really, really well. We missed swine flu. We didn't, didn't spot that. Well, we should have got that better. We didn't spot it because we were, we were thinking birds. We weren't thinking pigs. So it's very hard. Excellent. Are there any questions from the online audience before we come back over here? No? Okay. Uh, come right over to you. Um, with question one about the emerging viruses burning out before yeah. causing pandemics, is it because they're mutating faster than our receptors? <clears throat> um, that's, a, that's a good point. That, that, that won't work because they need to keep... What a virus needs to do is infect cells. It, uh, the life of a virus, its key thing is to infect cells. If the host dies, the host dies, okay? It just needs to infect cells. So it can't lose the ability to infect cells. That would be, that would be committing suicide. So it, it select, natural selection will favor continual cell infections. That can't work. The most likely reason, I think there are a number of reasons. One is that viruses that are too virulent, that are too nasty, don't get going because they, they kill the host too quickly. So you, you, there's some very simple math, math, math you can do to say what's the level of hosts you need to sustain yourself in a population given how, how nasty you are. So very, very benign viruses who don't kill the host, they can survive in very small populations because people are just moving around very freely. Very, very nasty viruses who knock the host out very, very quickly, they need bigger populations to sustain themselves. Ebola, the kind of poster child for bad viruses, that emerges in Central Africa, very small populations. It burns itself out because it doesn't get enough hosts to continue its moving. It's too virulent. It knocks them out too quickly. So if you're too virulent, you, don't, you just don't get going, okay? So, which is good news, right? Um, the other reason why is, is probably that they're not... They're not totally adapted to human cells, okay? So, so avian H5N1 virus, the one we were worried about before H1N1 came along, that virus is a bird virus. It doesn't work that well in human cells. So it, it can cause disease, but it can't transmit. So if I can do my body, flu, the flu that when, when, when we get flu, the cells in the upper, upper respiratory tract are the ones that, we, that it infects. Avian flu kind of infects us too low down. So when we kind of cough and things, we're not, ex we're not coughing out the kind of cells from that, that deep down, that part of our body, it's too high. So it's not really gonna work that well. So um, these, some of these viruses, they burn out because they're not, they haven't yet become a, hu a real human virus. So H5N1 influenza is not really a human virus. Okay? H1N1 now is, okay? H1N H5N1 didn't.